Hello, uh, this is Michael with Rotoforge. I'm just going to show you a quick assembly guide to go along with the Excel spreadsheet, the bill of materials that I provided for Rotoforge previously, and show you what parts I've kind of got on my bench I'm working with to uh, make this thing happen. So, typical Rotoforge starts with a Ender 3 as the base motion platform. You could do it on principally anything, but what I've been working with is the Ender 3 because it's cheap, widely available, and reasonably easy to set up. It's not the most rigid thing in the world, but it has some potential being made exclusively of aluminum extrusion. Um, and so, basically I started out with removing the extruder pinch, the pinch wheel gears and the extruder motor, and removing the hot end so that I can make room for the brushless DC motor, the hollow shafted brushless DC motor in Rotoforge, and for an extruder that makes use of hardened steel pinch rollers because they resist abrasion more effectively and provide a bit better grip on typical metal wires like 1100 aluminum. Uh, something else that I didn't mention in the bill of materials, I have this sort of uh, <laughs> trash spool holder here made of bent copper wire Really anything will do, but metal wire spools don't typically come in the spool diameter required for typical PLA spools. Uh, it's just a little smaller, so I just needed some minor modification there. Just figured I'd show that to you. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, the basic parts are a piece of 1 inch by 1 inch by 1 8 of an inch thick aluminum extrusion or aluminum angle. Um, this could be anything from a three quarter by three quarter to a one and one quarter by one and one quarter, but one by one is kind of a good happy medium. And I made this printed drill template, the files for which will be on the GitHub um, and posted on the Discord. Um, it just helps keep everything aligned relative to each other nicely and makes it easy to drill consistently with a hand drill, um, assuming you have the right bits, which is an M6 tap and an M5 tap as well as an M3 drill bit. Um, and all this does is it makes, it, it basically produces a piece of this aluminum angle that has holes in it so that it can mount directly to the uh, gantry plate. And that's that aluminum plate you see there with the screws in it. It mounts with the regular mounting screws on the Ender 3 gantry plate and it provides a nicely aligned four screw holes, M3 screw holes for the BLDC and a M6 tapped hole for a pneumatic fitting for the Bowden system on the Ender 3. And down here, what you are looking at is the other basic components. We've got a M6 pneumatic fitting for the Bowden system, a bit of Bowden tube, a few wrenches to tighten set screws on the shaft of the new extruder motor, or the old extruder motor I suppose and an M3 wrench for tightening the screws that mount to the Ender 3 gantry plate and for tightening the screws that mount the BLDC to the plate that mounts to the Ender 3 gantry plate. Uh, the motor itself comes with a pack of M3 mounting screws and a M5 prop nut, lock nut. You don't need the M5 prop nut, but the M3 mounting screws are quite handy. Uh, the motors themselves typically come with a M3 screw, and I can't point to it, M3 screw in the back that holds the bell, I'm pointing to it with this wrench, that holds the bell of the motor on. It's necessary to remove that bell because, or not the bell, to remove the screw that retains the bell, and they're typically quite difficult to remove. They're a little bit, they're Loctited, so they can put up a bit of a fight when you try to remove them. Um, but what we want, these motors, as you probably can see, are hollow shafted. They have a shaft that goes all the way through where this bolt is. If we remove the bolt, we can see all the way through the motor, and that allows us to feed materials through the motor. Um, and that's how Rotoforge sort of works. Basically, we end up with a drilled acorn nut, stainless steel acorn nut specifically. It's an M5 stainless acorn nut. You can order these in large part on Amazon. I have them on the bill of materials. They thread onto the end of the shaft of the BLDC. Let me adjust the focus a little bit. There we are. They adjust a screw onto the shaft of the BLDC, the brushless DC motor. 
and once this bolt is removed, material can be fed in through this hole through the Bowden system, just like a regular filament in an FDM printer. And this motor is capable of spinning some 30,000 RPM, and that allows you to plasticize material through this hole in the acorn nut, which you can probably see. And that material then flows out of the hole and gets stirred onto a build plate in order to uh, make lines or build components. So let me see if I can actually get this bolt out. It looks like it's working. Cool. Some of them put up a lot more of a fight than others. They're all Loctite in place because they're intended to retain the bell during flight for like a drone or something of that nature, especially in the event of an impact. But in our case, they're not really... We'll replace them later with a, a different screw. Um, they're not really strictly necessary. And they can be difficult to remove from the wrench once you've uh, removed them. But I don't know if you can see that, maybe. There is a hole at the end of this motor. I'll take the nut off so you can see it better. There you go. Maybe. Yeah, there you go. You can see right down the bore. It's 2.2 millimeters on the inside. And the shaft itself is threaded to M5 on the outside. So there's just enough room in there for a 1.75 millimeter diameter filament, or roughly a 14 gauge metal wire to be fed down the hole. Now there's one other caveat to that, and metal wire tends to fuse with the inside of the shaft. So we have a couple of solutions here. To replace the retaining bolts and provide uh, resistance to the thrust produced by pushing a metal wire into the nozzle or into the tool at the end of the spinning shaft of the BLDC. We have these PEK uh, Peak M5 hex head bolts. These replace the metal screw I just removed from the motor and we drill a hole through these to make them hollow using a 1.8 millimeter drill bit. And behind them or underneath them on the table is a bit of 2.2 millimeter OD Bowden tube. Uh, it's pretty cheap on Amazon and it's 1.8 millimeter ID. So it's just big enough to allow the metal wire to go through it without interfering with the metal wire and to provide some measure of protection against abrasion and welding between the wire and the inside of the shaft. Uh, you'll need a precision screwdriver, probably an M5 socket for the hex head uh, peak screws. You will need some banana clips because these motor wires are a little tricky. Uh, they aren't color-coded anyway, but suffice to say that the one in the middle is the data cable and the one on the left and right are the positive and negative poles. And so whenever you end up with a servo tester, uh, let me just grab one off of my machine, there we go, this blue servo tester here is pretty common on Amazon, it's cheap, it's probably seven dollars, something like that. It allows you to manually adjust basically PWM output signals to the BLDC. It is, it needs to be connected to an ESC, an a engine speed controller, a motor speed controller. I'm using a, just a typical 30 amp sort of Chinesium one here. It's got three output cables, a red, a black, and a blue. The blue one goes to the middle, the red goes on the left, and the black goes on the right when you're looking at the motor from the front. Like so, when you're looking at it from the front, the leftmost cable goes to the red, the rightmost cable goes to the black, and the middle cable goes to the blue. And that should get you turning in the right direction for uh, feeding material through without unscrewing the nut on the end of the motor. So, okay, so now that I've gotten the bore of this motor emptied out, the hollow shaft cleared, anyways so that I can insert a screw to retain the bell, something hollow for material to pass through. And I've gotten a CR10 extruder upgrade with hardened steel gears, as you can see back here, installed. And I've fed some aluminum craft wire, 1100 aluminum craft wire through. Let me just push this whole gantry down so you can see it better. Get a better view of the system. Okay, there you go. And this is a typical Bowden tube. There is aluminum wire in here. If I take it out, you can see it. It's going all the way through to the end. 
I've just pressed that down into a typical M6 pneumatic fitting at the bottom here. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the four mounting screws that are M3 mounting screws that came with the brushless DC motor and we're going to go ahead and attach the brushless DC motor well first we're going to replace the screw that went in the back of the brushless DC motor with a peak hex head bolt they're uh, five or six millimeters long they are M3 threaded and they have a five millimeter hex head I can show you but there's your peak peak screw Take that, just thread it in here. And this is where that precision screwdriver element comes in handy. This little guy, five millimeter hex. Just use that to screw it down. We have to rotate the motor bell to get it to thread all the way down. And just keep threading until it is flush with the back of the motor. I'll show you what I've got here in just a second. There we go, try not to drop it like I just did. And don't tighten down too much, just a little bit. Back off a half or a quarter turn after you tighten it all the way down. Okay, there you go. It's a peak screw threaded into the motor. So now the bell will not come off. <clears throat> so now that we've got that set up, what we're going to do is undo the pneumatic fitting here. It's an M6 pneumatic fitting, typical for a Bowden system. Goes in the back of a hot end usually. Boop. Now that that's out of the way, I'm going to take our M3 wrench, make sure that we're in focus, and we Thread it into place. Once you've used the drill template to make your aluminum angle iron gantry support for the brushless DC motor, this should be essentially a piece of cake. Well, it might require a little fiddling because the parts are small, but what can you do? And it helps to leave the screws with just barely threaded in the holes until you are relatively sure. Sometimes it helps to even take them out. There we go. Until you've got all of the ones you want threaded in place. Threaded in place. There we go. And it may be necessary to sand the peak screw, so you may have to plug in the motor, as I'm about to do, and run it for a moment. You just use a typical piece of coarse or fine grit silicon carbide sandpaper to sand off the back of the screw until it uh, is not tight, not too, not presenting resistance to the motor. Um, you could also principally let it just wear in. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. That doesn't always work reliably. Sometimes the screw gets a little melty, and that causes problems later. Something is wrong. There we go. Mm, no, it's fine. They're lined up. You don't want to tighten them all down at once. Tighten them down in a series, kind of like you might do a uh, wheel on a car, for example.
There we go. There we go. Now that we got a screw in every hole, we can tighten them down with relative impunity. Now, if you feel the motor, it should spin completely freely. You may feel some resistance due to the peak screw rubbing against the bottom of the aluminum. So either the peak screw is not tightened down all the way, or you'll have to take it off and just sand it down to give it a little more clearance so it doesn't resist the motor. Um, if you don't, the motor will run with higher current demand and may uh, overheat. So it's important to Keep that static current requirement as low as you can. It should be something on the order of 1.7 to 2.2 amps at, with no load, basically. Um, so I'm going to take a moment to hook this up and sand it off and just and be back. Before I do that, I need to put the banana clips. It would be good if you can get these color coded, coded, but I don't happen to have any color coded ones. So all they are is a screw, set screw on the, on the top with a standard 3 millimeter banana spring banana and I like to put the red ones on the outside but you can do whatever you want there we go just insert it until the tip, the exposed tip of the wire on the motor is underneath the set screw and then tighten it down with a precision screwdriver or an electronic screwdriver not too difficult. There we go. And it should stop and you should not be able to pull the cable out of the banana clip after you tighten it down. And that is how you put the power leads on this mechanism. Alternatively you can get some proper ESC to BLDC ESC to BLDC uh, motor connectors. You can buy basically the same setup banana clips that you can solder to the ends of the leads. There are many ways you could go about this, but I just use these because I swap the motors fairly frequently due to the abuse I put them through. Uh, there we go. There we go. Not going anywhere. Okay, and the last one. And then I'm going to have to cut again. Now that we're done with that, we will take the black one and we'll plug it into the blue lead of the ESC, the data lead. Take the right lead, plug it into the black wire, the negative the ground. We'll take the other black lead, the other red lead, on the left side of the motor, plug it into the red. And then we should be just about ready to go. Let me give it a quick spin test. Uh, 11 volts is what these motors run at. The servo controller here allows me to control the speed manually. I've got it in manual set mode. Ah, it's spinning the wrong way. Okay, so I told you wrong. It looks like you actually have to cross the red and black polarities on these leads. So the leftmost lead actually goes to the black, and the rightmost lead goes to the red. And we're back. So we've got the motor controller all connected, the engine speed controller connected with the banana clips. I'll, I've included links to this engine speed controller in the build of materials, I believe. Um, if I haven't, I'll update it to include it so you can find it yourself. Uh, the only thing interesting about it is that it has a power lead on the end. It's a standard two lead, positive negative sort of DC power input. And I've got it connected to my DC benchtop power supply here. But if you want to run the motor directly, the brushless DC motor directly on the power supply from the Ender, I've included buck converters in the build of materials that will work for the purpose and that I've tested uh, so that you could just feed a power line directly from the power supply to the ESC 
and control it with the same servo controller or replace the servo controller this guy servo controller with the output from one of the fan headers on the control board for the Ender or from your control board of choice whether that's uh, something being run by Clipper or another firmware I'm just running it all on the Ender 3's base sort of default platform just because it's cheap a lot of people have it and it's not that difficult to mod um, so with no further ado I'm going to spin this up and just show you what it looks like when it's running as intended initially there we go turn the power on it'll make a bit of a beeping sound from the servo controller to let you know it's about to run and then it'll run and it should consume uh, as you can see about uh, two 2.3 amps at 11 volts or so. There's a fairly wide range of operating currents that you can work between on the low end just under an amp. At the high end almost 3 amps probably. 2.2. Depends on your motor and your particular setup and how, how careful you've been in the assembly. Um, but that's basically what it should look like. <clears throat> so the next thing is to use the motor as its own sort of drill motor. It has very good runout characteristics. It's quite a stable rotation with very little overall runout on the axis of rotation. So it's relatively straightforward to use a drill bit, which I've included in the bill of materials here. Uh, just plain nitride drill bits, 1.8 millimeter diameter. Uh, drill bits, yeah, 1.8 millimeter diameter drill bits for boring the hole through the peak screw in the back. And you could do this by hand, but it's a bit hazardous uh, because of the high rates of rotation involved. These are 1.8 millimeter diameter, um, so very small, kind of hard to grip. Uh, if you're going to do it by hand, I would recommend using some needle nose pliers or some vice grips and just very carefully letting it drop onto the center of the motor as it spins and applying a little bit of pressure so that the rotation of the motor helps to sort of self-center the drill bit, almost like on a lathe. Uh, otherwise, you want to let the motor spin up and hold it in a pin chuck or a pin collet, pin vise, or maybe even in, in a typical drill chuck, and uh, just do the same thing. Let it center and pull itself into the peak, sort of touching it. You want to peck drill, you don't want to go through all at once because the peak will catch your, screw, catch, your, catch your drill bit and will throw it around or break it. And might hurt you, so be very careful. Um, so I'm going to grab some pliers here and I'm about to show you how I go through a typical drill operation. Okay, so we, like this, very simple, needle nose pliers, grab the drill bit, turn the motor on, higher speed is typically better, you can only go so high though, so See there, it's running at like 2.2 amps, 11 volts. I'm just gonna sit this guy on top. Oh, hold on. One other thing, I almost forgot. We have to reverse the rotation in order for the drill bit to cut effectively. And then swap it back when we're done in order to be able to print without the nut coming off. Without the, the die or nozzle, the tool, if you like, coming off. So here we go. Now it's spinning from our angle, counterclockwise. There we go. You're gonna have to squeeze this pretty tightly to make sure it doesn't spin. And you just drop it into place, basically. Don't drop it, just press gently. Touch. It should essentially center itself and make a very nice concentric hole. You just take your time, touch it gently, treat it almost like a dremel tool. It'll take a little force, give it a little time to cool between passes. Try not to lose your grip on the drill bit.
and clear out the chips periodically if you can. There we go. And it should give way at some point. You can stare down the bore and make sure that it's cleared. Once you see that the hole is empty and cleared, you can put your drill bit away, turn the motor off, and you should be just about ready to go. The last thing to do is to take your pneumatic fitting, Bowden system, with the aluminum tube already fed in, which you may or may not be able to make out. I'll show you it in a moment. And you make sure that this is drilled and tapped the hole just over where the motor is that I'm pointing to in the middle of the four screws in the drill pattern is drilled and tapped to M6 to fit this pneumatic fitting. You may need a washer, an M5 washer, also drilled and tapped to M6 to give you a bit of space so that this pneumatic fitting can tighten up but not bind against the back of the motor because the 1 8 inch thickness of the aluminum plate is not quite sufficient for both things to be connected without interfering. It's also really important to note that these motors get pretty hot in operation. Uh, typically they operate at 55 degrees to 90 degrees Celsius. Under our particular operating conditions, they may get as hot as 100 degrees. And if you, and if you use plastic for this material, something with a relatively low heat deflection temperature like PLA, there's a good chance that it will just melt or at least deform. And aluminum makes a good heat sink material to help the motor un under load stay cool basically. Keeps it from burning up the motor, keeps it from overpowering or overheating the magnets and uh, resulting in a, a failure basically. So tighten this pneumatic fitting down. It's either stack washers, stack M5 washers with M6 thread or uh, just tighten it down until it's secure but does not bind against the back of the motor. I'm going to run another spin test here just to see what the current is. Yeah, you can see it's got a little bit of a bind on it, so I'm going to, there we go, it's settling again. So I guess the peak screw is wearing in a little, um, but you can see that this is, this pneumatic fitting is not moving, it's secure, it's not vibrating or rattling or anything, so it shouldn't come loose or, or go anywhere. And so now we're ready for the last thing, which is to feed wire through the motor until it gets to the bottom, and I'll move to the, the next thing next. And so the next thing will be to turn the Ender 3 on, which I've got it on now. You're going to have to heat up the extruder, or you know, if you remove the extruder it won't be a problem, and you set, set up the necessary firmware conditions so that it will work without it and be able to run the extruder without the heater, or without the, yes, be able to run the extruder without the hot end. But in my case I've just left the hot end on, so I'm going to heat the hot end up uh, to at some safe temperature that the printer will agree with so that the hardware lockout ceases. It's relatively simple to cancel that if you want to, but I'm very lazy, so I can't be asked. And so, once it gets to a high enough temperature, you can then use the extruder to move filament, move wire, in this case, through the newly established pathway that leads from this pneumatic fitting through the hollow peak bolt we just drilled and out of the hollow shaft at the end of the BLDC. Which I'm going to raise up a little higher so that we can see it better. Uh, there we are. There we go. And the extruder is extruding and it's moving wire. having trouble though. There we go. Sometimes the wire will get caught and you have to look out for that. Uh, if it gets caught on the screw or some other hang up in the system it's important that you be prepared for that. Very interesting. I'm going to unscrew this first. Sometimes it's easier to just undo the pneumatic fitting entirely. <sighs> ah, I see. Okay, there was a little bit of debris that I didn't clear out clearly. Okay. 
So now that it's just floating here in space, sometimes it's easier just to feed material through that way. You can see it coming through now. Once it's long enough, you can just stab it through the motor. There you go. And it should move more or less unimpeded. There you are. You can see it's being fed through. Okay, and it stopped. So, one of the last things you'll need to do is provide some kind of protection. The Teflon tube works okay. It doesn't last forever, but for just testing different tool geometries, different hole diameters, different hole shapes and configurations, different numbers of holes, um, it gets the job done. It keeps your wire from welding to the interior of your tube, most critically. And it seems to do a very good job of preventing undesirable situations uh, where it makes it difficult or impossible to recover the motor after a jam or a failure has occurred during the course of an experiment. So I'm going to cut this wire off right at the tip of the motor. I'm not sure if you can see that. Yes, you can. Okay. Boop. Just get it as flat as possible, as quickly as possible. And then I will take this 2.2 millimeter OD Teflon, tu Teflon tube and 1.8 millimeter ID Teflon tube and slip it into the motor shaft around the wire. It should just slide into place and take up the slack. And once it's there, I'll pull it out to check the length. That looks correct. Close enough anyways. Looks like it's butting up against the base of the peak screw, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. Basically forms a tight connection, tight junction with the peak screw at the top. and keeps the wire from contacting the titanium hollow shaft at any point. Once I'm done there, just cut it off flat using a pair of side snips. Typically they come in the kit with your Ender 3, but you can also get them from other places for relatively cheaply. And then when we're ready to go, we take our tool, in this case a stainless steel M5 nut, M5 acorn nut that has been drilled with a one millimeter hole. There you go, now you can see it. Yep, there you go. One millimeter hole. We will now insert this, or just thread it on really, until it's completely tight against the base of the shaft, and so that it provides a complete sort of tight seal. It's important that if you use acorn nuts, you find acorn nuts with a very flat interior, because we want that flat section, flat landing at the end of the acorn nut, to butt, basically tightly fit against the end of the shaft and form a tight face, so that whenever the aluminum goes down onto it, gets pressed down through this hollow shaft and hits the end of this, it forms a flat sort of plug or a mushroom maybe. I have a, an example of it, I have some pictures of it that I'll post. Um, and that flat mushroom, in fact I even have one right here. There we are, I have an example I can show you. It looks like a foot or something, or a post, it's hard to to come up with a name really. But you see at the very end where it's kind of mushroomed out, it will form that little plug at the end against the back of the nozzle. And that is what where material will be plasticized and what allows you when you continue to push the wire with the extruder, it prevents the material from flowing back up the shaft. Um, and it basically forces it to go out of the orifice in the nozzle or in the tool or the die or what have you. So uh, that's pretty much it. I'll run some printing tests and may include those here in the video, but that's all there really is to the assembly of a rotor forge right now. It's a very simple and crude process by any measure. So thanks a lot for watching. Uh, if you have questions, leave them in the comments below or drop them in the Discord. I'll be happy to answer them uh, or suggestions for improvements on this presentation style or how I've done this. I'll probably be producing a text and image version of this assembly guide, like an actual written version that can be passed around as a file instead of having to refer to a video. Um, but I just wanted to make this as a, a quick sort of follow-up to let you guys know what was going on and to help people who might be interested in building one of these themselves to build one themselves and how to use and let them know how to use the build materials, which is also in the description. 
So thanks a lot and uh, have a great day. Okay, so one last thing before we go. Quick note, the tip of this device, once all of this is installed, does not end up being the same height as your previous hot end. You might have already noticed that, but I just thought I would mention it so that nobody goes and does all this and then finds that their printer is crashes the first time they try to run something with it, because this is not the same. It requires you to recalibrate the Z height for the tool. So you'll have to basically re-level, you'll have to recalibrate your Z offset and recalibrate your home offsets uh, and set those in firmware or what have you. I may release a version that's exactly the same height as the stock hot end, but that will require some pretty appreciable design changes and uh, it wouldn't be too hard to do, but it might take a while to get right because of how this is oriented and adapting to an existing hardware system has some, some caveats. So for now, this is just something to be aware of, a note, a quick note. Just be sure to reset your home offsets and your Z offsets whenever you first set this up before you run any tests or any prints. Uh, so yeah, thanks again and uh, have a great day.